is on the 10, oh, hold on, let me just, the 10, the, the, the three domains of life skills and the 10 sub domains of life skills. And I'm going to sort of break all the rules of doing a PowerPoint where I don't like to read things, but there's a lot of these uh, slides that I do have to read because it, 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 it defines what the certain categories are. Um, so I'll try not to sound too preachy, but what I want to do is get through this as quickly as I can and then take get going. And I'm going to start with the fact that... You know, all roads lead to adulthood. And oh, by the way, this is life skills, not just for students with autism, for students with any disability, but especially autism and any other developmental disability or someone who has an intellectual disability, but not just exclusively for people with intellectual disabilities. Okay, um, we're all going to become adults, right? So it's coming and our kids aren't going to live at school, right? So um, adaptive and life skills um, are known to play a really vital and role, role in the outcome of adults. Um, and yet, in my experience, I saw life skills being underestimated by school teams and parents time and time again. I want to say a word about transition because it, it's impossible to, to unmingle uh, transition from adulthood, right? They go hand in hand, right? So uh, actually the very first paragraph, the Individuals uh, Education Act states this, it, the, the, um, the IDEA is to ensure that all, or transition is to ensure that all children with disabilities have available to them a free appropriate public education that emphasizes special education and related services designed to meet their unique needs and prepare them for, and here's the money shot, okay? Further education or what's known as post-secondary education, employment, and if appropriate, independent living. So what I want you to know when you're, if you're in the, uh, if you're looking to your own child's future and planning transition with your IEP team, that it is those three driving principles. Think of those three areas as umbrella statements, right? And ev all your IEP goals and objectives flow from further employment, I mean, further education, employment, and independent living, okay? And transition is actually defined as the movement toward achieving the goals for further education, employment, and independent living. So those sort of anchor us to what the whole purpose of transition is. So why are adaptive skills so important? Well, because research shows that increasing adaptive skills actually increases outcomes in adulthood and to have the skills we need for day-to-day -day living. You know, just really quickly before I go on to the next slide, when I talk to parents, and I say, well, how are your child's life skills? And in my own anecdotal data that I take, right? Most parents think that life skills are hygiene, making a sandwich, you know, putting on our deodorant, washing our, brushing our teeth, things like that. And I don't know if we can raise hands or anybody can say something, but if, if that's your experience, you know, it's, it's this very limited scope of what they think life skills are. And so, Hopefully you're gonna learn here today that it is so much more than that. Um, let me just talk really quickly about some of the reasons why life skills are underestimated. One is that a lot of parents think if I start teaching my son or daughter life skills um, while they're in high school, I am now starting to lower the bar on the expectations and I've just like dumbed everything down. Of course, I don't believe this is true, but this is this is something that sometimes people believe. Um, oftentimes also parents and school teams really mask um, the, the skills of, of a child because we end up doing things for their children. I'm guilty of that. I, my son is 27 years old. I still do things for him. Now I'm always working on life skills, but at the end of the day, I'm a mother and without realizing it, I, I'm guilty, right? Um, also, there's a, a misconception, especially um, for a lot of students who have autism, that if you have a higher intelligence, your life skills are commensurate with your intelligence. So you're going to be just fine. You don't need life skills. 
Um, and then another one is, is that life skills are only reserved for people who have intellectual disability. And I'm here to see both. Um, and hopefully after um, you've seen this presentation and we've had a lot of questions and answers at the end, um, you'll feel differently as well. Okay, so there are some other terms for life skills. You might hear them referred to as adaptive skills, activities of daily living, functional skills, or adaptive behavior. Let me just really explain quickly the difference between an adaptive skill and a life skill. All adaptive skills are life skills, okay? And what are adaptive behavior. So those, that's a subset of life skills. So all of these things are often used um, interchangeably with what life skills are. I'm going to read you the definition of what life skills are. They're defined as practical everyday skills needed to function and meet the demands of one's environment, including the skills necessary to effectively and independently take care of oneself and to interact with other people. Now, as simple as that sounds, there's a lot of skills that go into being able to do all those things. And we're gonna find out about them. So life skills has three categories and under the three, the three domains, there are 10 subdomains. So it's conceptual, social and practical. And we're gonna start with going over what the conceptual skills are. So the category of conceptual and these are actually the most challenging skills in the life skills domain because it requires applying insight into situations. And many times for students who have intellectual disabilities, developmental disabilities, um, and or autism, um, deriving insight and applying it into situations um, is a very higher order thinking and, and difficult skill. And this includes reading, numbers, money, time, and communication skills. So let's go over all of, these are now the subdomains under conceptual skills. The first one being communication skills. And this is understanding and using verbal and nonverbal language. So for example, my son is nonverbal, right? But he still communicates, right? He has a communication system. It's also our speech, our language, listening skills needed for communication with other people, including vocabulary, something that's very rarely taught in IEPs, responding to questions and conversation skills, et cetera. The other subdomain under conceptual skills is functional academics. And this is using reading, writing, and math skills in everyday life. Hold on, I'm just going to tell my husband I'm in a presentation. I can't take your call right now. I'm in a presentation, okay? Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm going to turn my phone off. Okay, and if I didn't answer that, my husband would just keep calling and calling and calling. So that's why I had to do that. Sorry. So, you know, um, think about the fact that I'm, I'm terrible in math. I'm, uh, it is my weakest link. OK, but I have the basic reading, writing and math skills to apply to my independent functioning for everyday living, telling time, measurements, writing notes and letters. Um, I, I'm a basic math kind of a gal, but it's just enough for me to, to get me through life. So that's an example of, you know, these these functional academics. So the third subdomain under the domain of conceptual skills is self-direction. This is another one that can be very challenging for many of our kids. And that's problem solving. Problem solving can be really, really a challenge. Very seldom do I see an IEP goal for problem solving, which quite frankly, is probably one of the most important skills in my opinion that we can have, in addition to being a flexible guy, somebody who can go with the flow and you know, sort of zig and zag where life zig and zigs and zags, which we know it does every single day. Exercising choice, initiating and planning activities. Um, the skills needed for independence, responsibility and self-control. So there's your behavior, your emotional self-regulation, including st starting and completing tasks, keeping a schedule, following time limits, 
following directions and making choices. So raise hands, or I don't know if there's a way to do this, but are life skills more than you imagined so far? All right, there's probably no way for me to, oh wait, there's a chat going on here. What is everybody saying here? Welcome, oh no. All right, never mind. Anyway, I'm going to assume <laughs> that you are all already learning that life skills is more than you thought. Okay, we are going to go on to the, I gotta get rid of this chat. How do I do that so I can see what I'm doing? How do I do that? Oh, here, hold on. Sorry about that. All righty, so we're gonna go on to the next domain of the three domains, social skills. And as a domain, these are the skills we need to get along with others. And these include understanding and following social rules and customs, obeying laws, this is an important one, detecting the motivations of others in order to avoid victimization and deception. So a lot of times when we think of social skills, we just think of the highs and buys and thank you very much of the world, right? Our, our basic social competencies, but it's so much more than that. So let's go into the subdomains of social skills. The first one, it, and it, one of them is social skills. So it's maintaining interpersonal relationships, understanding emotions and social cues, understanding fairness and honesty, obeying rules and laws, and the skills needed to interact socially and get along others with other people, including having friends, showing and recognizing emotions, assisting others and using manners. Okay, the next subdomain, there's only two subdomains under social skills, and that is leisure skills. Another thing that is so often um, underestimated and yet so important. And this is the ability to take responsibility for our own activities and participating in the community. Um, these are the skills needed for engaging in planning, leisure and recreational activities, including playing with others, engaging in recreation at home, following rules and games. I mean, let's think about it. We all need to, even as adults, still be like kids and have fun in life and be able to occupy ourselves with something that we enjoy. Okay, and we're gonna go back down to the third um, domain. Um, and that domain is practical skills. And these are the skills needed to perform activities of daily living that include feeding, bathing, dressing, occupational skills, and navigational skills. These are often what people think are the only life skills, right? Because we always talk about these. The first subdomain under uh, practical skills is self-care, and that's our ability to eat, dress, bathe, toilet, groom, hygiene, et cetera. The next one is home or school living, and that's maintaining our living space, doing housekeeping, cooking, laundry. Um, these are the skills needed for basic care of a home or a living setting, including cleaning, straightening, property maintenance, repairs, food preparation, performing chores, et cetera. Community use, um, shopping, using public transportation, using community services. And I'm gonna say not only using public transportation, but driving. That's a whole bailiwick for me. That's a whole thing that I, I get very upset about because a lot of IEP teams think that driving shouldn't it's not the school's responsibility. It's not the school's responsibility to maybe teach them how to drive, but the set of skills that you need to be a responsible driver, that's another issue. Skill, there's the skills needed for functioning in the community, including the use of community resources, shopping skills, getting around in the community, et cetera. Here's another one that is so often overlooked and I think so important. That's health and safety, right? The ability to protect oneself medication management, being able to call the pharmacy and order your own prescriptions or pick up your prescriptions. Now, let me just say a caveat here. I have a, my son cannot do half of these things independently. And, and even if he could do a fraction of them, it's with support and that's okay. That's okay. So no one, you don't have to have all of these skills independently, by the way, everybody's different and that's okay. Um, you know, responding to health problems, skills needed for protection of health, um, responding to illness and inju injury, including safety rules, using medications, showing, showing caution. And you know, a big one in this today 
uh, for today's world is internet safety, social media safety, um, you know, being safe on the big. And the last subdomain under practical skills is our ability to work. Um, and that's to maintain part-time or full-time employment, either competitive or the ability to work under supervision, cooperate with coworkers, be reliable and punctual, and meet Merck standards. Skills needed for successful functioning and holding a part-time job or full-time job in a work setting, including completing work tasks, working with supervisors, and following work schedule. Um, I know that that's a lot, and I wanted to breeze through them because the first half of this presentation is on understanding those 10 subdomains of life skills and how important they are to adulthood. And I hope that's where the questions are going to come in. You know, how do I incorporate these into the IEP? All questions can be on the table. Um, just before we go live, and I don't know, um, Thea, you'll put everybody on live or how we're going to do this. If you want to stay in touch with me, um, there are a couple of ways that you can do that. Um, I'm very, very active on my social media life skills platform. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. Um, I'm trying to get onto YouTube. Um, I'm, you know, if you're on Instagram, that's probably the best way to follow me, but I'm on the other ones as well. And um, if that's not your bag, um, you can sign up for my e-newsletter um, where I'm constantly um, sharing information, um, all information that parents can use. Um, Thea tells me that you all have my um, email. Um, it's julieswan at comcast.net. That's J-U-L-I-E. S is in Sam, W-A, and is in Nancy at comcast.net. And you can email me directly and say, Julie, put me on your on uh, your newsletter list and I shall do so. So Thea, I am at the end of um, banging out all these life skills and now I can go on to questions. Absolutely. Yeah, well, that was wonderful. I think, I mean, uh, Jennifer Burzak. I'll commented. get rid of this. There, you there go. we go. Yeah. Perfect. Jennifer Burzak commented what I was thinking. Yes, life skills is more than I thought. This is wonderful. So um, now you guys can feel free to unmute your mic, ask uh, Miss Julia a question, or if you want to write in the chat box and I read it out to her for her to ask, we can ask as well. So yeah, let's get those questions rolling. Let's ask uh, Julie how we can incorporate these things into our IEPs, et cetera. Let's, let's get the questions. Who has a question? And I, I, see, uh, I see somebody I know from Connecticut who must have found out about this because I put it on my social media, L D. Hi, Julie. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> put on my video, but I'd scare you, but I'll do it. No, anyway. no. It's nice to see you. Hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, Michael's doing great these days. He's 28. Um, oh, come he's on. He's semi-verbal, um, but he gets his point across well, and he just moved into his first apartment. That's oh. a smart home, so I can watch everything going on. And oh, wow. I wow. underestimated what he was capable of. He's doing his own laundry. He's making his own meals. Uh, doing it. I mean, he's probably 75% independent daily living. It's wonderful. Yeah. What town and does he live in? We're in Pomfret. And okay. we're looking for roommates, but oh, I do have nice. one that might be moving in shortly. So it's uh, Good for him. It's been really, really cool. So I think what I would suggest to people is not underestimate because I, he always told me mom will do it. Mommy do it is what he would tell me. And I'm like, buddy, you got to shovel this walk. Now it's yours. <laughs> you know, um, yeah. and he yeah. stepped up really well. So good for him. Well, I'm so happy to see you. Nice to see you too. I Lisa, see, I, I see, I see actually have a question questions. for Linda. Linda, yeah. I've never thought about, uh, yeah, a smart house would be great. So is this something that you bought it, you own this house and you like put all the cameras and whatever in this house and you can kind of control things. How to how, tell us a little bit about that. I think a lot of parents would be interested. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, I actually bought a duplex um, in Pomfret, which is near where I live. Uh, it's a couple miles away from me. Um, I outfitted with the help of DDS. I got a grant that paid for his 
um, medication dispenser, the safety stuff for the water. So if it overflows in the bathroom, I'll get notified. It's all smart activated. So I will know if something's going wrong. There's something on his stove that shuts it off automatically if it stays on too long. There's a, there's a gadget for everything. Um, wow. We've backed off on some things because it just doesn't need it. But um, for the most part, I can see every room in the house. Linda, I'm going to have to be in touch with you. So uh, I might need to feature you on the life skills lady and the house. If you like, yeah, I we would can, love uh, to do that. And, you know, Michael, I had so little hope along the way that he would be able to function at this level, even being as nonverbal yeah. as he is. Yeah. But I walked out the other day. Um, it was the last day of the month and I walked in the next time and he had the May calendar all written out complete with holidays. Wow. Um, Are you okay with me letting everybody know I was your advocate? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. For a short while, for a little while. Yes. That's how we know each other, right? No. Yeah, I think our yeah. kids came, yeah. came up together and we bumped into each other a lot over the years. Yeah. But I'm absolutely happy to take any questions offline yeah. if people want to. It's, yeah. it's been a blessing for our family, uh, for him yeah. especially. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thanks for sharing, Linda. I think that that's really inspiring and, and you know, give some hope to some, some other parents and, and what good ideas I had never thought about, you know, outfitting a house with smart cameras. So that's cool. And it sounds like Linda's looking for some roommates. So personal message her if you have an older child interested in that. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to move on to some of the questions in the chat box and ask you, Julie, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so Crystal Miller says, I'm very happy you mentioned driving. I have high hopes that my son can achieve this. How can I get the school district to incorporate this into his IEP and pay for a driving school program with educated staff that I that understand autism? Right. Yes. Um, and I don't know if they have them down in Pennsylvania, but there's something up here. I believe they're they're throughout some of the parts of the country called um, uh, next driving next net, net uh, it'll I'll come up with it I, I I I it's on the top of my head um next street next street anyway so let me just say that um a lot of people who are in transition in school districts sort of have this very archaic thinking and we used to call it travel training right and that's very archaic right it's you know just how do you help somebody walk around a town or take a bus? Well, let's let's be honest. There's lots of uh, young folks with developmental disabilities who can be drivers. Now, I'm going to put paying for a driving program on the shelf for just a minute, and I'm going to circle back to that, okay? But I want you to think about the skills you have to have in order to be a driver. A, I would definitely ask your, your school district to help your child study for the driver's exam That's and support them. I think that's something you can absolutely ask for in an IEP. But let's think about this. You need to know how to pay, make a car payment, make um, tax payments, um, fill up a tank of gas. Um, what do you do if you get into an accident? Do, do you pull over? How do you talk to a policeman? Oh, and by the way, here in Connecticut, we have something called the Blue Envelope, which Autism Speaks was very, the folks at Autism Speaks were very involved in here in Connecticut. And it's a little controversial, but you, you, you would have to disclose your autism. And if you get pulled over and you have autism, you have a blue envelope. The second you hand it to the policeman, the, I shouldn't say the policeman, the, the police person, okay, um, they're going to know this person has autism. Um, and I don't, you, you know, look into your own state to see if you have anything like that. Um, if you don't have something like that, you should be making up your own card. My son has X, Y, Z, or, you know, I have X, Y, Z. Um, here's what I, I might present like this. Please don't think I'm being flip or anything like that. I'm going to tell you a story. I have a client who, um, was driving and he got pulled over by a policeman. And the policeman said, are you taking, are you on any drugs? And this young man said, well, I take Adderall and I take something else. And the policeman thought he was being flipped with him. And it almost got into a fist fight because he thought he was being you know, insubordinate with him. Okay. And 
these are examples of all of the hidden skills that you need to have if you're going to be a driver. You can't pick up people who are walking on the side of the road. Um, you know, there are so many hidden skills to driving. So all of those things that you can think of, that is for me, fair game of what needs to be in an IEP if your child is a driver. As far as paying for a driving school, do I think that within the realm of what the IDEA would allow us to do, that I think that's a legitimate thing to ask for? I absolutely do. If it were me and the school district gave you pushback on that, I would probably just go, you know what? I'm taking this one for the team. I'm just gonna pay for the, the darn school myself and let me get all the other things. I'm not sure it would be worth the legal battle if you had to go to due process over something like that. We would probably end up being the first case to, to, to fight something like that, but it would probably cost you thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars far more than that class is gonna cost. That's my answer to that. But I right. do think it's a leg legitimate thing to be asking for. Wonderful. It falls That's into the category of asking school districts to pay for a college class. And you know, you'll see how bristly they get when you ask for that. I'm not, I love school districts. I'm not trying to bash school districts, but there's not a whole lot of outside of the box thinking sometimes with um, on these matters. A great okay, answer, Julie. One? Great answer. Uh, I, I think that that was oh. very informative and a lot of things that I'd never thought about, especially making a blue envelope. So if you guys haven't noticed, I am kind of taking notes as she talks. And so if you want to copy and paste, or I can send you um, the, the chat box, if you want to copy and paste uh, the notes, you know, I just, I just put DDS grant for smart house, medication dispenser, water level, stove gadget, cameras, um, and then you know, to Julie's question on how to incorporate these skills for IEP, um, I, I wrote that in there as well. So, and as, I apologize, I've got bad allergies. So it's just um, blowing my nose. I apologize. It's the season. It's the season, isn't it? Yeah. Um, okay. So our next question for Julie is, what are your feelings about government agencies such as DDD or DVRS? New Jersey agencies. So Julie, I'm not sure if I, I informed you on this. Our, most of our parents are from, from New Jersey, New York, DMV area, DC, some in Connecticut, some Boston, California, Florida. So it's nationwide. So you may not know the question to every state, right. but. Right. So I'm assuming what this person is referring to here in Connecticut, we have DDS, which is the Department of Developmental Services. They're all about the same thing. Everybody in every different state calls it something different. So I think this is what you're talking about. Um, just to do a little quick thing about this, um, here in Connecticut, in order to qualify for DDS, um, you have to not only have an intellectual disability, which is a 69 IQ or below, and you have to have um, very low adaptive skills, okay? Um, now, other states, they don't have an IQ quotient. It's all about adaptive skills. Um, I wish we didn't have the IQ quotient here in Connecticut because it really um, kicks a lot of kids who should have um, De Department of Developmental Service funding, but that's a whole other subject. Um, I, first of all, I, I just want to say that every state is different. Here in Connecticut, um, and I'm sure Linda can speak to this as well, um, we don't have a lot of money. Um, it, it, we, we used to, it used to be that if you wanted your child to be in a group home, you could just basically say, I'm ready for him or her to be in a group home. And voila, it would happen. Um, this is not the way it is anymore in our state. Um, you have to have sort of the one man down um, syndrome going on. You're a single parent, you're old, you're, 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 you're disabled in some way yourself. Uh, you have to show an incredible hardship um, in order to get housing. Now I'm thinking what Linda did is with their own money, they bought a house, which a lot of parents are doing if they can. And then the funding that they get, which the funding comes from the feds, right? Half of the funny money comes from the, um, uh, um, uh, what are they called? I forget the name of the grants. 
uh, whatever those grants are called, and the other comes from the states, the, the Medicaid, the Medicaid funding, and then the state. So that's what, that's how our kids are funded. Um, and that's through your level of need drives your um, your lot, your, your, your how much you get funded. So I'm going to assume that Linda bought the house, but you, you um, staff the house with the funds that your son gets through DDS. Is that correct, Linda? Is that what you do? Um, he gets 17 hours a week, which is not quite enough for him. So I fill in the gaps and we okay. fund the house, at least the mortgage because of the other renter. So okay. Michael's input is negligible. Oh, that's um, so, wonderful. And, Very, um, we have yeah. the output for the first, the sale, but beyond that, it's been running itself. Yeah. And you know, on that note, if your son, uh, and does your son have day program hours or home support hours? Oh, uh, he goes to a day program. He goes to a day program. I would encourage you greatly as time goes on. Do you have um, uh, uh, first choice? Uh, what's it called? Community um, first choice. Community first yeah. choice funds. That's what the 17 hours is coming from. Okay, so he is the day program hours and then the 17 from Community First Choice. Okay, right. Community First Choice is a federal program. Um, you know, we used to want to, you know, people who adults with disabilities used to be in institutions, so to speak. We don't do this anymore, right? So our government really wants disabled adults to be participating in their communities. So this is a federal program called Community First Choice. And I think it gets like, I don't know, maybe it's 15 bucks an hour or something like that. And you can hire anybody you want to do hygiene, anything to do with self-care and getting your um, young, your adult out into the community. So um, anyway, I don't know if I answered this person's question, quite frankly. <laughs> I'm okay, sorry. I'll, I'll read it again. What are your feelings about government agencies such as DDD or DVRS? I hope to God that they continue funding our children because they don't have to. It's not a mandate. We just all, as a country, um, we have decided that we want to help people who can't help themselves. Um, so for example, um, when Trump was, and this, is, this has nothing to do with, I'm not making a political statement. When, Trump was in office, they, they were gonna do something called block grants. So right now, let's, I'm talking about Connecticut. The way that Connecticut, we get federal money from Connecticut to Connecticut is it's driven by need, okay? The way that they were going to do it, that it never happened, but watch out people, because it could happen anytime, is something called a block grant, where they say, we're not gonna do it by need anymore. Connecticut, you got this many kids, we think you need X, Y, Z money a year. And if that's not enough, oh, too bad, you figure it out, okay? So it's, in my opinion, the fact that we haven't gone to block grants yet is very, very important, very positive. Um, I think that we should all be thanking our lucky stars that these programs still support our kids because there's nothing in the law that says anybody has to do it. Oh, That's what I think. Yeah, yeah. That, and I that, think that. I think there's a lot of bureaucracy and I think it's worse than the IEP system, but it's it's the system. So, so my hat's off to, you know, this community, our special needs community, you parents, I mean, you have to wear so many hats, you have to be a cheerleader, you have to be a warrior, you have to go in and fight for, you know, your kids rights, and then to, to you know, convince the, the rest of the population to, to, to keep helping that, you know, they, these are great, wonderful contributing members of society, and we want to help them be the best that they can be. So that's exactly why we, you know, want to share these resources and, and, and try to try to help you be in the know. Who else has a question? You could type in the chat box or you can unmute yourself if you guys have a question for Julie. We have a quiet. Um, any, does anybody have a question about how to incorporate any of these life skills into your IEP, the transition planning? Marisol, it just jumped on. Maybe she has a question. Hi, Marisol. Okay, great. Hi, how are you? Um, this has really been enlightening. So I guess I, I 
so I have a son who's 14. He'll be 15 in August. Um, okay. It's interesting you were talking about IQ because my son has always tested um, within an average intelligence range, yeah. but when it comes to his executive function skills, he is extremely severe. And I'll mm -hmm. give you an example because you're talking about life skills. Sure. Uh, he's in eighth grade and he'll be going to high school next year. And um, I love his middle school teachers. They see the good, the bad, and the ugly. They know him very well. I, I, we live in New Jersey. He had to take the state testing. And unfortunately, because of his low working memory and his slow processing, he literally took one hour to answer one question. Mm -hmm. So he took him the full seven days to get through the testing. And he's still at 253, which today was the last day, did not get through it completely. Yeah. So my question to you is, um, you know, as a parent now with a child going into high school, but I'm already as a mom, of course, thinking about life after high school and everything. What, what would you recommend to someone like myself, maybe other people that it's called, like what should we be already planning and, and talking about or, or just, I don't, mean, I don't know if I'm trying to. Okay, uh, well, I can answer that. And first of all, I, I do wanna say here in Connecticut, you, we can opt out of state testing. Okay. Um, you usually just have to write a letter and, you know, that's a, a very personal decision, by the way, but you, you know, that's something that I've, I've asked them to document all the yeah. struggles and frustrations that happened for this last week. Yeah. They're going to put it in his student file. It's a discussion I'm going to have with the team yeah. next week. It seems a little torturous. Very. Yeah. It was yeah. Hard for his um, teachers to see him go through this. You know, my advice to any parent is that you really Ha and this, I encourage you all to go to my website, lifeskillslady.com, okay? Why? I spent the first half of the pandemic doing this website out of a total place of passion. I literally walk you through how to start the transition process for your child. Here's the thing, you have to know the basic laws, your basic rights, right? Um, I have a website with a, my partner, um, uh, attorney Jennifer Laviano, who's a special education attorney here in Connecticut. Um, we have a website called yourspecialeducationrights.com. And it is a video-based website that helps parents understand their rights under the IDEA. And one of the series that we have on there is just called IDEA Basics. What's prior written notice? What's an, an independent educational evaluation? That, I mean, just the basics, right? I also have a book, and I'm uh, trust me when I tell you, I don't make any money off my books, so I'm not telling you. I have a book called Your Special Education Rights, What Your School District Isn't Telling You. It's on Amazon. It's like 17 bucks. I, I, I swear to you, like we make nothing on it. And then that's not why I'm telling you. But you have to know some basic things about your rights because I never want a parent to be in a position where the school district knows more than they do. And that's really, and that's why, if, and if you feel that you can never get there, work with an advocate, somebody who can go, who knows as much as the school district does. So that's the first thing. The other thing that I would say is, you know, I, I am an advocate, all right? And I, and, and, What's amazing to me, and I know parents are very overwhelmed, right? But the basic thing that I want every parent to know about an IEP is something called your present levels of academic achievement and functional performance. Because from that flows all of your IEP goals and objectives. So the very first thing that we do is we assess a child in all suspected areas of disability. You do the assessments, from those assessments, you establish those present levels of functioning. What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? Anything that's a weakness and as a, as a adverse impact of your child's disability and that weakness, though that set of things that you identify as weaknesses that adversely impact their education, that's social, emotional, behavioral, and adaptive, 
turn into IEP goals and objectives. So you sort of like, I want you to, uh, parents to understand how the IEP is built. So no one can take advantage of you and sort of have the wool pulled over your eyes, whether it's intentional or not, because what you don't know can hurt you, right? And it's all on my website, by the way, okay? I have it all laid out. The other thing that I really want parents to know is what was on my very first slide. And now in the federal age of transition is transition services must be in place at the 16th birthday or sooner. Here in Connecticut, a couple of years ago, we everybody who has a disability has to start the transition process at 14. But you can also start it younger if the IEP team agrees, okay? The whole purpose of transition is to make sure that our kids grow up, as, as my friend Jen Laviano says, so that isn't the ultimate goal for our kids to be taxpayers. Now, my son will never be a taxpayer. That's okay. He still has a meaningful life. He gets up every day. He has purpose. He's happy. He's engaged. And he's got a great life that I've helped him build. It's not what somebody else might think of, you know, but it for him, that's what it is. Okay. So not everybody's going to be a taxpayer, but we know that we all want to wake up and have something meaningful going on. But the goal that I want you to know about transition is you should have a statement for what you want to, what your child wants to achieve upon exiting special education for post-secondary education. Does that mean that they want to go on to more training, to, to be a hairdresser, to go to community college, whatever? What is the goal for your child in the second area for employment? And what is the goal for your child in the area of independent living? And the IDEA says, if applicable. Well, quite frankly, if you're somebody who has a developmental disability, autism, or an intellectual disability, and you've been assessed for your activities of daily living and all of your adaptive skills, somebody I would, and you come out 100% perfect, I might argue you don't need special education. So I like to put an independent living goal in there that says something to the tune of, you know, Joey will live independently and be able to access his community. You know, all the skills that go into living independently, Linda can tell you, right? There's a lot, all of the things that were in the 10 domains that I talked about. So I know that's a lot that I threw at you, but there are some anchor things that I want you to know. And like I said, it's all on my website. I just, I was also exploring your website earlier, Julie, and I just wanted to mention that she also has, um, what is it, uh, the, the guide for what you should know going into an IEP meeting? You didn't mention that. Yeah. Um, so um, Jen and I, attorney Jennifer Laviano, um, we designed a, um, I, I, it's like 999, I, it, it's, it, but it's something when, once you download it, you have it forever. And it literally has the 10 questions that the IDEA wants to have happen at every single IEP meeting. But the average parent doesn't know about it. So this is just a guide that makes sure at every IEP meeting, you're asking these questions and you're able to take notes on it. Amazing. I think that that's such a helpful, you know, simple tool that you guys worked hard on. And I'm excited also to know about your partner. Um, we would love to hopefully have her on another summit series in the fall, because this is our last one for now, because we're about to go to summer camp. But we'd love to hopefully have her on in the fall to talk about rights. A lot of parents don't know their right. rights. And like you said, that, right. that, is, that is so important and it should be in the forefront. So I'll right. talk to you about that later for sure. Right. And if you want to um, go on your specialeducationrights.com, um, Thea, and you'll see us there talking about all the rights. Great. I'm, I'm just taking notes as you're talking and sending them through yeah. to everybody. And sometimes uh, I feel like I talk so quickly. I'm just trying to get out all the information that I can. I hope I haven't been too speedy. 
you're a wealth of knowledge just exploding to share the resources and that's it that's exactly how i am i'm not as knowledgeable because i'm not a parent of a special needs child so that's why i bring on people like you that are knowledgeable to to share um you know of course we we do life skills and everything at summit camp and we work on those things but i learn something new every seminar these seminars i mean i love them just as much as the parents do because they help me do my job better and and raise your kids yeah. Um, okay. So another question, uh, have you had any experience with Connecticut's, uh, division of vocational rehabilitation services, job placement help through the state? Yes. So here in Connecticut, it's called B Press, uh, Bureau of, and we also have a program. There's several programs that they have, and I'm not an expert at it, but there's like level up. So when you're still in high school, um, it, you should be asking your, um, once you're 16, asking your school district if you could get level up involved. Ask me to give you the specifics on them. But one of them is where, you know, um, you know that you can actually go out and work um, and get um, job experience. Um, and get assessed for how well you're doing and identify barriers and all those kinds of things. Um, after you've got, after you've exited special education, BRS has other programs where they help people who have disabilities find jobs. And um, I highly advise people to be working with BRS um, because there are several programs that they that uh, they can design around your child's specific needs or your young adult specific needs, I should say. Sorry, Julie. What was the acronym for BRS again? What what does it stand Bureau, for? The Department of uh, the Bureau of Rehabilitation Services. Okay, perfect. That makes sense. Wonderful. Um, go ahead. Oh, that was it. You know, okay. I will share a little tidbit that I always like to share. You know, um, I went back to school when I was in my 40s and I became a disability specialist. And it's one of the things that I learned when I went back to school. And that is the history of how we got these agencies sort of developed, right? And that was after World War II and um, soldiers were coming home from war and they were disabled. They were you know, uh, injured. And so we started, and this is a loose version of the history, okay? Like, don't look in the history book and say, Julie got that wrong. I'm just giving you the gist, okay? Um, but, you know, our country started this idea of rehabilitation services because we wanted to rehabilitate our soldiers, right? Some, as time goes on, um, we've morphed the this community with all disabled people right and then somewhere along the line we threw people who are poor into the mix so you have to be poor and disabled so i'll give you a story when my son when i was applying for um you know all the services um the um one of the questions i had to fill out was uh, I think this, I forget which one this was for SSI, maybe the social security income. Um, uh, anyway, one of the questions was, if you don't get this money, will you basically throw your kid out on the street? You know, and I remember calling up my DDS um, caseworker and saying, this is the, this is like Sophie's choice. I mean, you know, who, who what kind of a mother could do that? Right. You're like, Julie, the answer has to be yes, you will. <laughs> and because, you know, we've made this system rely on the fact that in order to get these funds, these disabled folks also have to be poor and have no, basically little to no assets whatsoever. So it's, uh, I don't know how interested you are when that story, but it always kind of fascinates me because somehow these two, the two ideas of disabled and being poor got intermingled somewhere along the line in our country. 
Yeah. That's really disheartening. But but that's interesting history to know. Yeah, and it's a very loose version of the history. <laughs> no. Nonetheless, interesting. Um, uh, so Ruth just wanted to share some information. In some states, you can ask Voc Vocational Rehab to be a part of your IEP transition team. Yes. And yeah. then um, BRS has job coaches and can also set up vocational observation slash job shadowing to see if someone might be interested in that job. So that's actually, yes. that's actually something that we do at Summit Camp. I don't know if everybody here knows we have a nine month program that's after summer and it starts in September and it runs through May. This is actually our last weekend of it. And we have kids or young adults, postgraduates living up at camp. And we set them up with jobs in town and, uh, you know, we help them work on their resumes. We're working on a lot of these life skills that Julie is talking about. It's just kind of built into the program. And, um, that's what we do. We have job coaches. So our, our staff members, they're also house parents that live in the, in the dorm style houses with them and they go to the jobs and they try out a bunch of different jobs throughout the nine months to see what they might be interested in. Because, you know, a lot of, I mean, when I was growing up, I just knew I wanted to work with special needs. I, one of my best friends, my mom and her best friend had kids at the same time and she had Down syndrome and I didn't. And I just knew I wanted to work with special needs because I'd grown up with her my whole life and taken her to her speech and everything. Um, but, you know, a lot of people don't know, and especially our kids there, they can be very indecisive and don't really can't harness what they're into. And so this is a great way for them to uh, try out jobs. But a lot of programs have this. Um, I know Best Buddies has a job program. Um, it sounds like BDA. There's there's many, many programs. You just have to find them. And that's what we're all about is connecting these resources. So if you are a parent and you have your child in, um, in, a, in a program like this, share it in the Facebook Parent Resource um, so that other parents know about it or share it here. Yeah. Yeah, hey, that sounds wonderful. Who funds a program like that? So Your right program. now we're, we're private pay. Um, they have had some okay. success with um, some some of the government funding paying partial or yes. some schools. So if you're yeah. 18, but you're entitled to up to like 2021, 20, uh, some of the schools yeah. will pay for you to go uh, to, to a program like this or a program like ours. So we have yeah. had some success in, in that area. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah. But Thea, is this a postgraduate program in Honesdale? Yes, this is the postgraduate program in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. And so it runs September through May. And like I said, this is our last weekend of it. And then I go up and we get ready for camp and it's a whole crazy summer and then it'll start back again in September. So we have um, open enrollment for that starting in September. What kind of jobs are in your program? I hope they're not just cleaning. No, actually, actually I need to post our Instagram. Um, friend, one of our kids, uh, she just finished her employment at her favorite job, which she likes. She was a barista at a coffee shop. We have, we have a lot of placements. Um, Homesdale's a small town, so they all know us. Uh, and you know, we're, we're very chummy with all of them. So we have placements at like Home Depot at, um, there's a pet store. There is, um, the coffee shop, like I said, Black Brass, it's in, it's in Homesdale. Um, one of our kids worked at a Mexican restaurant as a um, bus boy. He started, well, started out as a hostess, then went to bus boy, and then went to waiter, as you do at most restaurants. That's kind of the hierarchy as you go through. Um, so yeah, there's, lot, there's lots of different jobs. Um, so yeah, kind of customized employments. But I, I'm not here to, uh, you know, promote Summit Camp. You know, we're a great program, of course. But there are many programs like this. Uh, so, you know, we just have to, we have to share them. Um, I know, like Sounds I said. wonderful. Bus Buddies Jobs is a great one. One of my friends works at, um, and yeah, a lot, lots of great ones. So, you know, definitely if you want to talk about ours, you can talk to me um, anytime. Everybody, oh, I see Kate Holland on here, another Connecticutite. Oh, wonderful. Customized employment. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, guys. Well, I think this is a wonderful presentation. Uh, if anybody has any more questions, feel free to unmute yourself or video and ask. Um, but yeah, I, I think that this was, this was so amazing and so helpful, Julie. And like I said, we hope to have Julie's partner on in the fall to talk about uh, some of our rights, especially as an attorney. That would be great. And then if you guys have anybody that you work with, um, you know, a, an advocate or uh, an attorney or um, a, a speech therapist that's great or a life skills coach, anybody that 
would be a great presenter. I'm always looking for presenters. So I do this once a month. We've had some really good people on. I've had a psychologist. I've had, or we've had, we've had a psychologist. Um, we've had, uh, uh, what do you call those placement people? Educational consultants. Um, I, I try to make them so different so that, you know, it's sharing resources. And nobody asked me to do this at Summit. I've just always had a passion to uh, share resources and Summit's a great platform. And so, uh, I told my boss I was doing this. He was like, oh, sounds great. <laughs> so yeah, um, <laughs> I, I just love sharing resources. So that's what I'm here for. So you guys share resources with me. Uh, if you guys have anybody that other people should hear talk, please send them my way. And I would love to annoy them and ask if they would do a, <laughs> do a, do a seminar with me. So thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you so much, Julie. Yeah. yeah and, and Linda, I don't have your email anymore so please want at comcast.net so we can be back I in will touch. Do that. thank you and i just want to thank you thea and um i'm i just my absolute pleasure to um share all this information and you know i always just say whenever i go to a presentation if there's just one thing i take away i consider it um you know a win-win and i hope that you've just learned a little something that pushes you uh, you know, a little further in your journey and path toward, um, you know, helping your child have a successful um, life and adulthood. Absolutely. I mean, selfishly, that's kind of why I do these. I love continuing education. This is my field. I love working in the special needs field and helping people. And uh, so it's, instead I of hardly tell, it's barely <laughs> noticeable. Instead of just me having the conversation with the professional, I just invite 50 other people to come and listen and learn as well. So thank you guys all for being here and have a wonderful night. Good night, guys. I'll have this thank recording you, everybody. Up. I'll have this recording up on YouTube soon. And I've also copied the chat. So I'll put all my notes in the comments of the YouTube. So if you forgot anything or don't remember what an acronym was, that'll be there. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.